I think I think we can start, right? So welcome to this distinguished speaker series uh, with the Malaysian Alumni Club of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. So today is Tuesday, October 20th. It is 6 p.m. in Kuala Lumpur, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Beijing. Uh, it is 7 p.m. in Seoul and Tokyo. It is 5 p.m. in Jakarta, but Antoine is joining us here from Bali, where it is 6 p.m. as well, 3.30 in New Delhi, 11 a.m. in London, and it is also 5 a.m. in Chicago, so maybe there is somebody watching us from Chicago. Last time there was one person watching us from Chicago at 5 a.m. So I'm mentioning all these time zones because we have people joining from all around the world. We have alumni from, from, from all around the world. Um, and they actually had 250 registrations this, this morning and around 160 of them were alumni or students of Chicago Booth. The rest were uh, general public. So thanks for all, all of you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, today uh, we are proposing, or today Chicago Booth is proposing a very interesting topic. Uh, this topic is growing unicorns into multi-billion dollar companies. And very particularly, how to do this during COVID. Um, unicorns are typically built uh, following a get big fast strategy fueled by an abundance of funding, but is this strategy sustainable in the long term? Or how can a unicorn turn into a sustainable company into a sustainable multi-billion dollar company, right? So the hot seat of monetization and profitability and pure hygiene operations is what really drives the difference. And here today we have two Chicago Booth chief commercial officers, uh, two unicorns in Southeast Asia, and they're gonna discuss about that. So thank you very much to our panelists for their time and for sharing their knowledge and their experience with us. Uh, we have uh, Antoine de Carbonel, uh, who is the Chief Commercial Officer in Gojek. And also we have Hari Vijaya Rajan, who is the Chief Commercial Officer or Group Chief Commercial Officer in One Championship. So I'm gonna start introducing Antoine. So Gojek, for those who are not from Southeast Asia, right? I mean, everybody knows Gojek, uh, Gojek in Southeast Asia, not to say uh, Indonesia, but for those who are not from here, Gojek is the first Southeast Asian super app. Uh, and is covering uh, multiple countries, virtually the whole of Southeast Asia and beyond. Uh, Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on-demand massage. Uh, so everything you can think of, uh, Gojek can do that. And Gojek is a decacorn, so it has a valuation of over $10 billion at this moment, right? Uh, in Gojek, Antoine focuses, he's the chief commercial officer, and he focuses on merchant strategy, monetization strategy across products, partnerships, uh, and product prioritization. Prior to being in Gojek, Antoine was a managing director in Kartuku, which is an Indonesian payments fintech. And prior to that, Antoine was a principal in a, in a private equity firm, also in Indonesia. And even before that, Antoine had been in McKinsey, in Dean and Company, in Credit Suisse, across the United States, and Europe. Uh, and, and for those who are trying to, to locate Antoine in the different booth classes, he's from the full-time class of 1999. Um, and also we have Hari uh, Vijayarayan, who is the chief group chief commercial officer in One Championship. Um, again, uh, for those who are from Southeast Asia, everybody will know what is uh, One Championship. But for those who are not from here, One Championship is the world's largest martial arts organization and is Asia's largest global sport media property with a global broadcast of 150 countries and more than that, right? And it is also Singapore's latest unicorn. Um, so I, I personally had the pleasure to meet uh, Harry before because Harry is Chicago Booth class, full-time class of two, 2010. And, and I am full-time class of 2011, so we had uh, a year in common. We met in 2010 in Chicago. Uh, and I think, Harry, after Booth, you went to Amazon uh, in Seattle, if I'm not wrong, particularly in the PC and accessories business. Uh, and after that, you moved to Singapore because you are a Singaporean citizen, right? You moved back to Singapore uh, to become the chief business officer at Lazada and also regional category manager for for electronic devices, right? Um, and prior to Booth, you were in Booth and & Company and in, in Chicago and in Microsoft in, in Singapore, right? Uh, and regarding myself, uh, so I am a data-driven a data marketing professional. I'm working in a, in a digital and telecoms conglomerate that is called Axiata Group uh, and is based in, in Kuala Lumpur, right? So this session, 
is supposed to be uh, very interactive. And as a matter of fact, we want you to ask most of the questions to our panelists. So you will see in the Zoom, web, in the Zoom uh, uh, window, you will see there is a Q&A session, uh, a Q&A place. That's where you have to ask the questions. There is also a chat, but don't ask the questions in the chat. The chat is in case you want to send a private message to some of us. But the questions, please ask them in this Q&A section. Uh, also vote for the questions because I'm going to try to ask the question that is the most voted one among, among those that you make, right? Um, and uh, as we discussed a few days ago, uh, I discussed with uh, Harry and Antoine about um, how to prepare this conversation, right? So one of the things that we say is that we wanted this conversation to be really authentic. Uh, we do not want to congratulate ourselves about how well we have done this or how well we have done that. Scaling up a unicorn is very difficult and particularly it is even more difficult during COVID, right? Uh, unicorns look very glamorous, uh, but life in the trenches is not that glamorous as, as, as people might think. And, and actually, Antoine was, was telling us uh, during the, the preparation that you are actually building the plane as you fly, as you fly right? Um, so, well, uh, perfect. So let's start, uh, let's start with the conversation. I mean, um, the first question that I will have, especially for people who might not know you is, well, I mean, you are non-founders in, in Gojek and in one championship, right? Um, so the conversation would be, how do you, or the first question I have for you is, how did you get into Gojek? How did you get into one championship? How did you get to know the CEO of Gojek, Nadim Makari, Morchatri, Sijotong, uh, who is the CEO of one? Uh, and and why, do they, why did they want to hire somebody like you at the very beginning? Maybe we can uh, start with any, any of you. Antoine, go for it. <laughs> All right, Adi. Um, well, I, I've known Nadim for many, many years, um, uh, and uh, and uh, even uh, when he started Gojek, Gojek was started in 2010, initially as more of a social enterprise project. That when he was at Harvard Business School, uh, and he literally set up a call center uh, for uh, motorcycle taxis. Uh, there are a lot mm -hmm. of motorcycle taxis in, in Indonesia called Ojex. Uh, so I've known him uh, since then, uh, and would be before that actually for many, many years. Um, we uh, and then uh, Gojek didn't take off right away. Uh, you know, Nadim uh, after business school went back to McKinsey, uh, and uh, and then he uh, he worked at uh, Zalora uh, for a bit, and then he he joined the fintech that I was working at called Kartuku, which is uh, an offline payments and value added services fintech. And then so we, you know, we uh, we got we got quite close then. Uh, he he got he got seated to start Gojek in 2014. Um, and, uh, and literally a couple of years later, he was growing so fast that he realized that he was going to go into payments and, uh, and he acquired a 20% stake in, in, uh, in Kartuku where I was working and that's when I moved over to Gojek. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, what about, what about you, Harry? How did you join, uh, one? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So before one, I was at Lazada, right. And, uh, you know, after the Alibaba, uh, acquisition of Lazada. I was, you know, I spent about four years at Lazada, working with the founders. And you know, after any big merger or takeover, the culture of the company changes. And so for me, I felt that my time at Lazada was done. And uh, you know, what I really liked about my time at Lazada uh, was working with the founders. You know, being uh, kind of having an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, working with uh, the CEO closely, etc. And I said, the next company I join, I really want to work in a, again, a fairly early stage uh, startup uh, based in Singapore, have a regional or global role, uh, well-funded. Um, and, uh, you know, so when I was doing uh, my research, there were not too many companies, uh, right, uh, out there, uh, which was still fairly early stage. I mean, you talk about the Grabs and Gojeks, they'd already shot past the Decacon range, and I felt that was Correct. too late. And so I actually met Chatri in one of the... Uh, uh, forums that, uh, you know, he and I were both speaking at, uh, and it so happened, it happened to be a CEO kind of award ceremony and a, a business leader award ceremony. I was picking up a award for Lazada Singapore. He was picking up one for the best CEO for the region, uh, wow. kind of, uh, <laughs> paths crossed. I shot him, I kept him, uh, I kept in touch with him. Actually, I just followed him on LinkedIn, started seeing all his inspirational messages on social media. I think about those videos, those him. inspirational videos that he has, right? Uh, which are really impressive. So I pinged him on LinkedIn yeah. about a year later after I met him. And I just said, hey, you know, I don't care to paraphrase what uh, Sheryl Sandberg 
uh, I think, uh, discussed with Larry Page back in the day, back at Google, when she joined, uh, she said, I don't uh, care about what seat you give me on the rocket ship. I just want one seat. So that's exactly what I said. I said, I don't care what role you have for me, if you have one at all, or make one. Uh, and so that's how I landed up at one championship. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, Chatri is a person that is so inspirational, right? I mean, I have watched some of his videos on, on YouTube and it really makes you feel something when you listen to him, right? Um, there, is, there is one of the videos that I really like. I'm gonna post it here uh, for all the people who are connected uh, because it's really, really, really interesting. Uh, very good. And now, I mean, maybe after this introduction, maybe we can go directly into the core topic of, of this conversation, which is uh, at the end of the day, you were hard to scale up a unicorn into a sustainable company and then COVID came, right? Uh, so how have been these last nine months uh, in your job? Uh, what challenges did you have? What has happened in the trenches during these months? Yeah, um, I mean, it's been difficult. I think it's been difficult. It's been difficult for the whole world. Uh, but, you know, from a Gojek point of view, we have, you know, transportation is a big pillar of ours um, and uh, payments is a big pillar of ours. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, we've seen a lot of transactions decrease, especially in transport uh, and offline payments. I think, you know, the, the, uh, the good thing I would say is that we, you know, luckily for us, I don't think we, we weren't, we were valued based on transactions at that time, which is a good thing. Uh, we also have uh, shareholders that are very understanding. Um, we, we focused on a few things, you know, we focused on uh, uh, developing the businesses that could help our partners more. Uh, so we, we started focusing a lot on logistics. Um, we redoubled our efforts on food delivery uh, and uh, shopping um, we we uh, we spent a lot of time on our internet payment gateway and our internet shopping uh, tools uh, such as WhatsApp keyboards and things like that. Um, we uh, we spent some time on our on we we actually canceled some current services. You were talking about massages. We actually stopped uh, yeah. giving massages and doing all those services. It was a very difficult decision, but it, it, we d we don't know when that will come back. Honestly, even after COVID, we don't know when that'll come back. Uh, so it was a difficult decision. So we started making some difficult decisions. We also did a, an extremely thorough uh, analysis of the quality of our workforce. Uh, I think, um, and, and I'm sure Hari will, will talk about that, but I think, uh, you know, you, you, uh, when you get to a certain point, uh, you know, when you're an early startup, you, you recruit a lot of people for growth. You need the headcount because you don't have the systems actually internally. Uh, and then at some point you need to rationalize, you develop you, you, a lot of automated systems internally, and you actually need to go through the normal process of actually normal uh, okay. HR. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm coming down now. Okay. And what about you, uh, Harry? Hello? Yeah, Hello? so, you know, it was, as Antoine said, uh, you know, one of the most difficult chapters in our company's history, definitely in my own uh, career. Um, you know, Chatri has said a few times that, you know, general who has not been to war is not a general. And this was the time for the troops to, to fight in the battlefield. Um, you know, I guess our business model is, uh, you know, it's an asset light IP heavy business uh, because we are a content business. We uh, excel in throwing uh, live events. Uh, we produce uh, esports uh, uh, content and we run tournaments and we now are getting to reality TV. Now, um, but for five months, because of COVID, the live event business was, was shut, right? I mean, the last event we did um, before COVID came full blast was uh, end of February. And then it really took about five months um, to come back, right? How significant is the live event business in the whole uh, of, of one championship? Yeah, actually, the live event business, we're we not an events company, right? Actually, we're a, you know, IP-based content business. Yeah. Of course, weeks, we used to have this cadence of live events, which would give nice peaks to our content viewership, both live on terrestrial TV, uh, as well as on social and digital media. Um, and so we had to really think about uh, pivoting. Uh, there were a lot of long conversations, phone calls, Zoom calls, um, and meetings uh, virtually, where we were thinking about, okay, what do we do when the live event business goes out for five months? I mean, our athletes are not getting matches. Um, you know, we are, our brand sponsors need uh, to have entitlements, which are shut. 
how do we shift that to other forms, uh, you know, athlete endorsements or, uh, you know, content that we do for brands. Um, one esports uh, business was also a, an event-based business, which just started last year. And it was very successful at almost 90 million viewers in the first tournament. Unfortunately, COVID hit right after that, after December, right? Which was the, our last tournament. And so we had to do a 100% online tournament, which is very difficult to pull off because you, it's all about where the servers how, are. How do you do a, a fighting tournament online? Not a fighting how, how tournament, this is one esports. This is one esports, which is a gaming. Ah, right? okay, that's for gaming. Okay, okay, okay. For gaming, we had uh, the teams based in different countries. And again, we had to make sure the server infrastructure was set up in such a way that it could be conducted uh, as a tournament online for over six weeks and went off without a hitch, almost 40 million people tuned in just across Southeast Asia. Um, and then we also said, hey, when we don't have sports content, let's do something else. You know, Chatri himself is a inspirational persona. Uh, it so happened that MGM Studios approached us back in February or March, also around the COVID times. Uh, and they said, hey, why don't we bring the uh, Asia's uh, or the Apprentice to Asia, right? Apprentice is a leading reality show out of the US and for many years uh, done with the uh, current US president. Uh, yeah, this is going to come through. We decided to completely architect it from the ground up uh, with Asian values, with a startup and sports spin. Uh, and what does it take to build a unicorn, right? That was kind of the thing. And now The Apprentice is actually starting to produce next week onwards. Wow. Uh, I produce uh, through the middle of December and we'll air it in uh, March, starting March next year, just after Chinese New Year. So very excited. So we, we did a bit of this pivoting. Uh, our live event business is back. In fact, the next match, we did a match uh, last Friday. We did a match the previous Friday in Singapore Indoor Stadium, closed door, went off without a hitch. In fact, now Singapore Tourism Board is asking us to do the next October 30th match with 250 people in the stadium. Again, uh, they wanted us to lead with this because we uh, followed all the protocols and the government picked us. So we're pretty excited and pumped about that, but we never relax. And we're excited to uh, bring action. I mean, this time, right, I was watching French Open two weeks ago. I was watching, uh, you know, the US Open before that. I was watching some soccer. I was watching uh, IPL for cricket. People want live sports back. You know, I think uh, six, seven months of this same, you know, yeah. work from home being cooped up. People need inspiration. And we're all about putting out inspirational content. We want to show how people tackle adversity. And we want to inspire the world. And, you know, and so you... So you have taken advantage of COVID in order to do a lot of product innovation, right? So Antoine was telling us more about operational efficiencies, uh, and but but you you have talked more about operation uh, about product innovation, correct? So launching new products, different esports, uh, the apprentice, right? Have you also had to address operational efficiencies, which is what what Antoine was saying? Absolutely. Uh, again, in these in these times, you can't uh, operate with the same uh, plan that you had before COVID, right? I mean, if our live events cost X to put up uh, eight nine months ago, uh, we have to now do it at a third of that price uh, or that cost, right? Because again, m margins are squeezed, sponsor dollars are squeezed, the economy is what it is. It's a difficult capital raising environment. We actually raised seventy million dollars in the summer. And unfortunately, that also meant that we had to rationalize some of our headcount. Um, and so we just want to make sure that we have a multi-year runway. Uh, and it means that we can't operate the way we did six months ago, eight months ago. So we are extremely lean. Uh, in fact, I thought before COVID, we were lean with, we had just about 200 people uh, on, on, our, on our roster uh, prior to COVID full time. Uh, now we're lower than that. But again, we're continuing to pull off these things. Uh, you know, uh, with with a with a, with a, with a shrinkage. Yeah, okay. Pedro, I think you need to. You can't. You can't focus on just one aspect. We actually need to focus on all aspects because COVID is is a black swan event that affects everything, right? So mm -hmm. you have to you have to focus on your customers and and think about you know like our customers before. Um, you know, used to take motorcycles. How do we you know after the big dip in March April? How do you convince them again to uh, to take motorcycles? So a lot of uh, protocols, testing of the drivers, and yeah, you have to get ready. Uh, the you know the customers are afraid of picking up the the food from the driver. How do you do the food handoff? So you actually need to think about the consumers a lot. Then you have to think about the service providers or the content providers. Um, for on, on, from uh, Hari's point of view, uh, on our side, it's really about the merchants, right? How are we helping the merchants? Uh, how are we helping the drivers? 
Uh, and then you have to think about your shareholders, which is one of your stakeholders also. And you have to think about, you know, what, what is best for them. So it's, it's, um, it's all encompassing. It's one of those events that's all encompassing. Can you give us some examples of what changes you have done in procedures, what changes you have done in products in order to adapt to the new situation of, the, of COVID, right? In order to make sure that people are not afraid of getting the, uh, the food, uh, can you give us some examples? Sure. I mean, on the on the basic stuff, right? In terms of the 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 restaurant on the restaurant side, it's uh it's telling the restaurants how to pack the foods and giving them advice on how to pack the foods. In terms of the in terms of the handoff procedure between the restaurant and the driver, we had clear SOPs to protect the drivers. The drivers themselves are tested, uh, and on our app, you actually can see. When the driver, you know, the driver's name, when was the last time he was tested uh, and the fact that it was wow. negative. So it gives visibility to the consumer. Then there are SOPs to, uh, to drop off the food, right, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the consumer side. But even then on, the, on GoFood, you know, we, we also started pushing ready to cook type of meals, not just ready to eat so that people could cook themselves. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are staying at home with their families. So, um, you know, we want to make that easy. We, uh, we, we, uh, we onboarded more restaurants, which are not restaurants. So convenience stores that had a food line, supermarkets that had a food line uh, and, and things like that to be able to enable. So you really have to think about, uh, 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 yeah, a, a lot of things. That's just one example for one of the products. Mm -hmm. There is a question here. Is the, the first question that we have got. So maybe we go to answer this question, right? It goes a little bit um, uh, on a different topic, but well, hi panelists, would you like, I would like to hear your opinions on this. Is it a good idea to pursue an MBA during a recession or will it be better to stay at my current job and help the company uh, drive recovery? Uh, is, this is more like a parenthesis in our conversation, but I just wanted to, to show that we that we answer the questions. So what do you think? You think a, a recession like now, I mean, for people that are in your companies, right, working with you, uh, young talents that tell you, hey, shall I do, go to do an MBA now? Shall I do it later? Uh, what do you think? You think like, because it's such a special situation, there is so much product innovation, there are so much uh, opportunities or operational efficiencies and, and things that have to be done at this moment, maybe it's better to be uh, in the job during these days or what, what would you recommend to somebody like that in your companies? Maybe I'll, uh, I'll go first. Um, you know, I, I don't know uh, the individual situation you're in and I, and I think the answer really depends. Um, it depends on, you know, your, your stage in your career, how long you've worked. Uh, it depends on what kind of company. Is it a kind of big blue chip company? Is it a startup? Um, you know, I'll just reflect on my own experience, right? And, you know, I think if I was very uh, fortunate to have done a, a full-time MBA at Booth uh, now 10 years ago, um, and I think it really helped me. I, when I looked at the decision to go to business school, I, it was actually, it, I entered in 2008. It was just when, you know, Lehman was collapsing and everything was collapsing, right? The big financial crisis. Um, exactly. So, yeah, you joined. You joined during the crisis, correct? Right. So it was just. It is a kind of simple <laughs> scenario. Here, it seems that you're making a future decision, but I think you really have to look at business school as a as a long term investment. And at least I looked at it that way. It's not about the job you get immediately after school or the next five years. Or um, I definitely think business school has been a tool I've used, uh, or not necessarily the stuff that I learned. In, in classes, I mean, I had access to great professors like we all know, um, and I took all of them, uh, pretty much you name it. Uh, but again, there are certain things that I still recall and remember from business school, nothing to do with, um, with, with the theory, but maybe actually in our entrepreneurship classes, Beverly Deutsch. Um, uh, Beverly Deutsch, yeah. James the Schrager. New Venture Challenge, building the new venture. Like, one of the things I still remember, James Schrager used to say, anything done well looks easy. I take that as a life mm -hmm. lesson. Right? Because again, whether it's a, it's a tennis match, a martial arts match, or esports, everyone it makes it look very easy if you're doing something well. Uh, but when you're in the dumps and you're in the trenches and you're getting shot every day, uh, you know that it's difficult. Life is difficult. Life is hard. Uh, so there are certain things I've taken like that, but also B-School and, and the Booth brand has uh, I've leveraged as I made switches. Right. So when I went to consulting after business school at Booth, then I went to Amazon, then I went to Lazada. 
uh, it has helped me. It has not been the only driver, but there are certain transferable elements in terms of uh, in how to manage a large team. Like in Lazada, I was managing an organization of about 250 people, right? And I had about 60% of the GMV of the company as a, my responsibility. So I'd never managed- That was electronics, that was electronics correct? Electronic. Yeah, so, so many things like that in terms of managerial decision-making, learning how to work in teams, like we had so many of these amazing classes that we used to, I mean, uh, uh, you know, what, what do you call the study groups and those kind of things where we had to work with type A people. We had to learn how to delegate. We had to learn when we had to do things on our own. There's all of that, right? Um, so yeah. I, I looked at business school, my experience is not just learning. I also looked at it when I was there as what can I contribute? And it's the same thing in every career move that I've made. What can I learn in this job? And what can I contribute? So in one championship, it is what can I learn? Yes, I could learn about sports media. I could learn about the content industry. I could learn about, uh, you know, media. Um, mm-hmm. And what could I contribute is kind of my commercial lens that I built at Amazon and Lazada and so on. So I really think it, it, it really depends. It is a tricky time. Uh, but in the long term, uh, if you're a believer in the long term, uh, if you are looking at this as, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 year runway, um, I, I think it's a, it's a good decision to do. But but if you're looking at it as, hey, what can I come out after graduating? What job will I get? It's an interesting uh, question. Maybe then it's not for you, right? Okay. What is your view, Antoine? On the MBA, on the same question. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, there are a lot of different parameters to me. I don't think that time really decides uh, and because of COVID. I think it depends on where you are in your life. Some people... Um, you know, uh, some people want to change careers. Some people want to learn something new. Uh, some people want the intellectual stimulation. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different reasons. I, I would say that uh, it, what's it's. I think the world. I think one thing is where that COVID is is sparking is a lot more conversations about life. Um, I think people are thinking a lot more about what does this job mean to me. Um, you know, some we read it, people are thinking more about the relationships also. Am I in the right relationships? And I think it's just that it's making you think more about the, the fundamental uh, uh, parameters that make you happy in life. So I would say, you know, very simply, if you're happy in your job, stay. If you're not happy in your job, leave, uh, whether that's mm-hmm. business school or not. Very good. Very good. Very interesting. Well, going back to the topic of, of unicorns and multi-billion dollar companies, right? Uh, in your view, what drives the difference between uh, a unicorn that is burning cash and a sustainable multi-billion dollar company that is that is pro- profitable? Uh, what drives that difference and what things have you been doing in your job in order to make that happen? And probably you are mentioning some of them, product changes, operational efficiencies. But can you give me more details about what is the, if, if, there, is, if there was a playbook to run, uh, how would that playbook look like? And where are you in playing that, that, uh, that transformation? Maybe we can start with Antoine as well. What do you think? Sure. I mean- you know, I, I think that I, I think that you know, at the beginning of a startup, uh, and I'm sure Hari will will uh, will echo this. At the beginning of a startup, you're trying to uh, you have very clear metrics in your field that you're trying to grow extremely fast, right? I mean, at the, the beginning, it's number of transactions, it's number of uh, of of active users, it's number of uh, you know GMV things like that. And I think that you're you're totally consumed with these metrics that your seed investors, angels, and potentially round A are telling you to achieve. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's an all or nothing type of a proposition at the very beginning, right? Um, after that, you know, growth needs to become sustainable. Uh, and it means sustainable for, for the company, for the users and, and, and all the content providers or service providers. Um, in order to continue growing, um, you need to have uh, scalability and a lot of scalability uh, it is, doesn't only come from the tech that you're giving to your customers and, and to your service providers. It's also the internal tech, the internal, internal SOPs, whether it's HR, whether it's I, IT, um, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the ERP systems that you're implementing for your finance and, and all that. And so I think, you know, uh, that's, that's very important. Why? Because, you know, initially you're going to grow uh, hundreds of percent a, a year uh, uh, very quickly, but then you really want to achieve that 20 to 50% growth that, 
is sustainable over the long run. You know, I think there was an analysis that was done by Sequoia not too long ago about what is the compounded growth rate of the most successful tech companies in the world, you know, the Amazon, the Fangs and, and, and the Chinese. And it's really tw between 20 and 40 percent a year from the count, you know, compounded growth point of view. But in order to achieve that, you need that scalability, which comes through SOPs and, and processes and internal tech. And, and Ari, what do you think? Yeah, or Harry, yeah, what do you think? And, and, then, and then I will have a follow-up question as well there. Yeah, I think Antoine is absolutely, uh, you know, spot on. I think, you know, uh, what I will add to that is we live in a very different time, even this year versus last year. And I think the whole uh, kind of situation with a lot of the SoftBank invested companies, we work in particular, has kind of changed the startup model um, and what really matters, right? And it's a fact of life. Uh, you know, uh, right from the second half of last year, we've seen what investors start to care about. When I was in Lazada in 2015, it was the only thing that mattered was GMV and growth, yeah. growth, growth. Uh, you know, when I started uh, the, or not started, but I inherited the consumer electronics business, it was 200 million uh, USD in terms of GMV. And I, in three years, grew it to two and a half billion, right? So it's a 10x growth in, in three years or two and a half years. Uh, but unsustainably, right? We're paying every day, selling phones at crazy prices, flash sales, throwing money, vouchers, uh, grow at any cost. Now, it's a very different story, right? We are invested by Sequoia and Tomasek and everyone else. It is not uh, just just burn money and, and you know grow unsustainably. It is very much uh, what, how can you grow and how can you grow profitably? And so even our products and our content stacks that we launch, we want to think of a revenue before cost mindset. So Apprentice, for example, we would not have launched it were we not profitable. So the last four or five months, our team has really actually broken even and then some, we're actually profitable. Even in this COVID environment, we've raised the money, which is several million dollars to actually produce it, uh, script it, create a world-class show before the first episode has aired. And so that is the mentality we live in. Uh, again, when one championship started nine years ago, Let's do the first event. Let's do the 50th event. Let's do the 70th event. It doesn't mean that we have to break even. But now we live in a world. Our esports tournament are 100% underwritten by sponsors. Our apprentice is 100% and our martial arts matches too. So this year, it's all about for us sustainable uh, growth. And we are not just about like in the early days, my early days at Lazada, throwing money everywhere and growing at any cost. Because guess what? Anyone can drop prices. Anyone can throw money if you have deep pockets. Um, but that's not the way. And I think Alibaba taught uh, us a lot over the last two years when I was still at Lazada and Alibaba took us over. Uh, Alibaba is one of the most profitable, actually the only pro probably profitable e-commerce business in the world. If you think of Amazon, they're not an e-commerce profitable. They're profitable in cloud. They're profitable in other things, in other departments. And th th that's what is driving the cash flow into the e-commerce business. Same thing with Flipkart in India, not profitable on the e-commerce business. Uh, Alibaba is the only profitable, and it, they, they, they've done an amazing job at it. Uh, a, a very asset-like model, uh, completely a platform, a lot of automation and tech, uh, and they use their uh, huge install base of four or 500 million uh, you know, on the app in China to create a run for the money for a Baidu and a, uh, you know, a, other internet platforms that charge advertising revenue. So that is a model I think that's sustainable. And so um, I think sustainable uh, growth, sustainable GMV is the way of the future. I, I, I understand that in a startup, there, is a lot, there are a lot of inefficiencies and that's why it's important to drive these processes, but to put in place these processes, right? And to uh, create a culture that every penny counts, particularly now during COVID, but how do you do that? Because typically the kind of people that you have in a startup are people who don't like processes. Uh, it is like being in a party and then suddenly comes and switches on the lights and says the party is over. Now there is this process, right? Um, how do you drive that cultural change so that people still feel uh, excited, uh, people still feel comfortable, so that it doesn't look like a corporate? How, how, how do you do that? How are you doing that in Gojek, Antoine? 
I mean, there are multiple facets. I would say just to, to respond quickly on, you know, why, how do you become responsible? I think, you know, you respond, you, you become responsible through, through your shareholders. I think you're, you know, we, you know, as, as Harry is saying, Temasek and Sequoia demand a lot of very clear metrics, right? So I mean, you, you, you have to that. And then you've got the people that you hire, you know, the, 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 the people that you hire are people, you know, some of us have more gray hair than some of some, some others, right? So it's having the right mix. In terms of what people- I that gray hair in the last few years in the startup. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, and you know, I would say that uh, why people come and work is not, it's not because of the irrational growth. I think people, uh, you know, and the rapid growth. I think people come because of, of, uh, of, of the vision, uh, of the mission, the values uh, of the company, of the, of the leaders. Uh, I think they come and join for for a lot of similar, a, a lot of other reason, other a lot of other companies, you know. Uh, and so we spend a tremendous amount of time on crafting our mission statements, our vision, on how we communicate externally to uh, to uh, you know whoever. Uh, uh, PR uh, point of view and internally from a, a values point of view it's extremely you know the Gojek values are extremely well defined and very strong and, and we we recruit that way we review that way and we typically let go of people as a function of our values yeah mm -hmm. uh, 100% I think uh, one of the first things that um, you know Max Bitten the ex-CEO of Lazada when I was hired when I was interviewing back in 2014 you know, I was in Amazon, I was in a cushy job, you know, not nine to five, but you know, it is, they, they work me like hell, but you know, it was a cushy suburban life in the U S and then this guy says, come to Asia and build Amazon of Southeast Asia. And then I was trying to negotiate my salary. And then he says, Harry, if you want to maximize your salary, this is not the place for you. Right. Because <laughs> want, um, all of that equity and all that, but immediate base salary and all of the cash in the bank, you have to think twice. So I think, again, when you think about today, right? Mission and values, right? For me at that time, building the Amazon of Southeast Asia, being part of that team, working with the founders was a big mission. It is, okay, this is a legacy I can leave. This is a story I can tell my kids and my grandkids. That was the first opportunity at that time I'd been working for what, 12, 15 years. That was the first time I could have had an opportunity to do that, right? Uh, with like 60% of the GMV of the company. And uh, so I jumped, I said, okay, I'm going to take a pay cut. And, you know, like a fool, I sold my Amazon shares when we we're still in the few hundreds. And now, in hindsight, uh, you know, it's 3,000. <laughs> but still, I, have, I took a plunge. Uh, so salary maximization, I think, is, is the wrong thing to solve uh, in, in these times, especially in a startup. I think mission and values is super important. Every company meeting that we do every month, Chatsby repeats, and it's risk of sounding repetitive. Uh, repeats every time, you know, what are our values? What is our mission? What do we want to do? What problem are we trying to solve? And yes, there are many people out there and any startup faces this, right? Lazada, we faced this, Shopee has faced it, et cetera. I'm sure Grab and Gojek have faced it. When you are getting big and you're att attracting the scrutiny of the public, people are going to take their own pot shots at you, right? The public aren't going to say things. People are going to take in Asia, is going to write a bad article, you know, and so on and so forth. And Bezos actually said it well, he said, you have to be willing to be misunderstood. It's okay. You know, people outside don't understand what we're trying to do. So we have to hire those, I don't know, 100, 200, 5,000 people who are really in it, not for the money necessarily. The money it will happen in the long term, medium term, if you stay and if you perform uh, and should take care of itself. But day in and day out, coming in, putting in the sweat, looking back in times of stress and duress and confusion, understanding why are we doing certain things? That is the gravitational pull for you to do and be part of it, right? So uh, we easily can tell who's come here for a short-term thing because the brand is sexy or because they've raised X amount of dollars and who is in because they want to put their and get their hands dirty and be part of the mission. And I think that's really important, especially in these times. Uh, this is the time you realize who's in it with you and who is just here for a, you know, a good experience and, and looking for the next uh, jump, you know? Well, that's yeah, I would say that. I would say that. Um, I would say just to close out. I think. I think you know the. I, I think there was a question about that. But I, you know, the the people that you're you're going to work with is is extremely important. Uh, and um, and and uh, you know, uh, 
when we when we recruit, it, it's it, it's it's grueling work, right? I mean, Hari will tell you it's just a, it's it can be extremely stressful. It is grueling work, but there are other places that are grueling work. But you you know you don't have some of the benefits that you might have another job. You have a lot of ESOP, but you, you might not have the same benefits. And so spending when we recruit people, we want to make sure that people are 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 tenacious. Um, that they can they can take a, a lot of heat. Right, um, and that they uh, want that you're going to get along with, that you can laugh with and and party with and and uh, spend time with also, right? I mean, so that goes back to to the values. It's 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 critical actually. Uh, it, it, nothing, very few things. I can't say nothing, but very few things are 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 more expensive to a startup than high turnover rate because you always have to recruit. Then it, it, you lose a lot of time doing that. Can you tell us uh, here what are the values of your companies or, or some of the values of your company and which is the first one or the most important one that you look at people uh, when you are hiring? Sure. Uh, sure. Harry, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, for us, uh, integrity is the number one thing. Um, you know, in any startup, uh, again, uh, whether especially uh, when you're a leader and also when you hire people on the team, um, you know, we really want to make sure that because we don't have time to kind of babysit everyone. We don't have time to micromanage. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we really trust people. Right? We're really trusting people to give their heart and soul to the business and, and not do anything which they would not be proud of or if their mom was sitting next to them would not be proud of, right? And so we kind of always have this thing around the sun sunshine test. Um, you know, always do things even when no one is looking that your mom would be proud of knowing about it, right? And so integrity is the number one thing. Uh, again, there are many times uh, where, you know, the, there's uh, in Lazada, for example, I can say that, uh, you know, there's theft in the warehouse. Uh, there's all of that. People were doing uh, repeat orders and creating bogus scam orders and all that stuff. Again, all those people were caught and ultimately terminated. Um, but I think it, it really sets the foundation of why are you here? One of the things at uh, Booth in Hyde Park was why are you here and not somewhere else, right? And so yeah, that's that uh, that panel, that luminous panel going down the yes. stairs. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, very inspiring. Yeah, especially in the startup, I think, and any company, I think you really need to be lucky to be there, uh, and and then therefore carry yourself out with uh, integrity. Second for us is teamwork, uh, because again, we are quite a flat organization. Uh, unlike when I was at Microsoft, you know, I remember I had 11 levels from me to as the most junior, my first job, and Steve Ballmer at the time was the top. So huge hierarchy. And I probably never even talked to my boss's boss. Maybe once in six months, I would talk to my boss's boss. But here, you know, in a startup, it's a pretty flat organization. People generally have access to the CEO, to me. I think uh, we need to keep it as flat as possible and really work as a team. People need to understand the mission. Um, then it's continuous self-improvement and I'll stop there. Continuous self-improvement to me is very important because you can't rest on today's laurels, right? Startup is daily execution. You know, yesterday's win is today's a new day, you know, and as Antoine said, right, building the plane as you fly. Uh, I used, I like that line, but it's also like, you know, opening, uh, building the parachute after you jump from the plane. Now every day you're jumping from the plane and you better hope that the parachute opens, right? And so it's really important that we treat every day as a new day. And every day, if you improve 1% in about three months time, you've kind of doubled your capacity or output or efficiency, or whatever you want to call it. And so those three, I'd say are the, are the main ones uh, at one championship. And what about you, Antoine? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Gojek. Gojek has uh, has a, a lot of quite strong values. We, you know, Gojek is a, a social impact for us is not a CSR. It's it's business strategy. Um, you know, a lot of the vision Nadim is. If I remember, if you remember, I I said he started as a social enterprise. Um, and so our first value, which is by far the most important, is it's not about you. Um, it's not about you. It's about your. It's about the drivers. It's about the consumers. It's about the merchants. It's about your colleagues. It's not about you, right? So if you're thinking too much about yourself, whether it's um, it's from a, you know you're self-centered or you can't take you can't take stuff too much and, and you're focusing about your compensation, it's not the right place. Uh, and then a lot of the other values are really around how do we make people nimble and how do we allow people to fail, um, but fail you know smart so um we've got uh become a scientist and become a scientist is really about problem solving um you know thinking outside of the box using numbers 
Uh, you know, scientists always use data. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, you know, that's one of our, our values. We have shoot for greatness because you have to always try and, and, uh, and, uh, and go fast and, and you're reaching for the stars, you know, so that's one of our, our values. And then all the collaborative ones, such as collaborate with, uh, collaborate with compassion, uh, earn your title, which is, you know, going down to the trenches and, uh, and staying up and working as hard as everybody else is necessary. And, and I would say that probably one of the more controversial ones is, uh, is criticism is a gift. Um, you know, you have to, if the way that we put it is, if Gojek hired you and you're in Gojek, there's a reason for it. We are going to give you feedback. We are going to criticize you if it was not it. Just take it as improvement. Take it as, you know, we care about you and we want to make you better. One of the, the things that you already mentioned about having a growth mindset and, and growing, growing in the job, right, uh, reminds me of, of uh, one of the lectures when I was in Booth uh, with Professor Weberly Deutsch uh, in building the new venture. And, and, and she was giving an example about uh, how founders sometimes have trouble to grow in their jobs. Uh, and when you are, well, you are non-founders, but you are growing a unicorn from, from 1 billion to 10 billion then later, right? Um, how do you make sure that you yourself as a chief commercial officer uh, grow at the same pace that the startup needs? Uh, how do you realize that you are not growing at that pace, maybe in all the aspects of your job? And what do you do then? Because uh, I remember this lecture and it was a very, very, very interesting. She was describing a situation of a person she knew about actually, well, how he became a bottleneck, right? Um, but uh, yeah, can you give me some examples? How do you do it in your, in your actual work? Yeah, so, you know, and Antoine said, right, uh, this, uh, anyway, just to add on to what he said, I think, you know, the key thing, if you think of one championship, even two years ago, so I joined in early 2019, uh, and let's say 2011 to 2018, uh, the company only had 40 people, right? 40 people um, valued at a billion dollars, right? And so uh, that those days, Chatri was making every decision. And it's impossible, you know, it's like there are literally 10,000 decisions that need to be made every day, and Chatri becomes a bottleneck, right? And he acknowledges this, right? And so then, any founder, and this was the same with uh, Max at Lazada and other things, right? When the founder and CEO starts the business, it's his or her baby, and everything needs to come through them, from the font and the poster to, uh, you know, the lights and everything, right? Um, or in Lazada, the prices of the iPhone and the flash sale, it was the same thing, right? Everything had to go through. And the quickly, once the company starts growing uh, and seeing uh, some hints of scale, you realize, and people around you, I realized that that's not a tenable and sustainable thing. Um, so then the next course of action is to hire people that are like mini me's or mini you's and uh, start to empower and delegate those people uh, to own and drive certain areas of the business and not even look at that, right? Uh, because the first thing that the founder wants to do, the founder is the CCO, the founder is the CMO, the founder is the uh, product officer, marketing officer, et cetera. And so once that initial founding leadership team has been built or the founders uh, team, uh, even if they're non-founders, I think it really helps uh, the CEO really focus on uh, longer term things, not the day-to-day -day tactical stuff. Um, and that's how, that's what I saw happen at Lazada with Max. Um, that's what I'm seeing now at One Championship. Uh, Chatri has really spent a lot of time thinking about our product uh, in the post-COVID era or in the new normal. Um, we don't know when COVID is going to go away, but in the new normal, um, but allows the business heads to really run and drive the business uh, to the best we can, right? And, and of course, provide input into decisions that he would make, and then we collectively work as a team. Um, I think the main thing here is, for me, uh, is the same thing, right? When I started, I was the only person on the team. I was meant to build the processes, hire a team. Um, and I was a uh, making your own slides, making my own slides, uh, you know, also answering, uh, upstairs and working with clients going in, uh, you know, dialing for dollars as they say. Um, and so the one is you have to lead by example, and then you hire people. So I like to hire people who I think have analytics 
communication and drive, uh, which I think are transferable skills that are useful in any business. And I think you can pick up media, you can pick up other things. Um, and now I built this, this team, of course, not all decisions were right. I made wrong decisions in hiring as well, had to let them go. But now I feel I'm surrounded by a really core set of people uh, not a huge team like I had in Lazada, but a very nimble asset light uh, team, um, which now I trust. So I don't need to be in every meeting. I don't need to make every decision. I really start thinking about, okay, what are the things also to, in, in terms of product, in terms of marketing, I think of the business as a two-speed system. There are maybe 30% of all my team's decisions that I need to make every day, and I'll probably do it. And then the remaining 70% is delegated to someone else. Uh, and other people on the team. And then I can spend that time. It was 100% when I started, right? And so I can really spend that time thinking about a bit more medium and longer term stuff. Because if I keep being in the trenches every day, like I was when I started, it's not going to scale. You're going to be in the same place every day. You're going to fight fires every day. And mm -hmm. so that's why you hire people better than you. You know, I've, I'm very proud to say that I love hiring people who are better than me uh, because, uh, you know, I really think that uh, A, it makes my life easier. Uh, but B, I think I really value that diverse input. And, uh, you know, I really want to mold people uh, who I hire to be uh, future leaders as well. Okay, that's very interesting. What is your take, Antoine? Well, I'm going to second that. Hire people that are better than you. I think it's critical. I mean, you have to, you know, it, 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 it frees up a lot of time. Uh, it, and, um, you know, fundamentally, if, if the values are aligned, then it, it's totally fine. And then maybe they will replace you sometimes, you know, companies that are growing very fast need help in, in a lot of different areas. And, you know, our head of, our head of uh, HR is now the head of our foundation and working on sustainability and things like that. Right. So there are, there are always roles. Um, I think, I think that um, the, the, you know, founders struggle with the growth and they struggle with the fact that they have to let go. I mean, I, at least I saw with Nadim. Uh, I think it helped Nadim a lot that he he recruited people that he uh, he uh, he thought could do the job. He recruited people that he liked um, and he could spend time with, and he recruited people that were no bullshit and could argue with them and tell them and tell them things the way that he was. So he relished the fact that people could disagree and 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 all that. You know, obviously, you can't say. I disagree. You have to prove it and have numbers. And and I think that I think that helped. I, I think that helped a lot. You know, um, from my point of view, what's helped is well. I mean, I must say to be very very open. I've I've been a good at for almost five years. I can pinpoint to two moments in those five years where I didn't think I was going to be able to grow uh, with the company. Uh, personally, uh, you know, I did in the end. Um, and I think the things that helped was one the what what Harry was saying. You know, hire people that are better than you. Spend time on the org. It's very important to actually spend time on, on the org, spend time with your people, nurturing people one-on-ones, and then be spend more time than you think you should on the KPIs or OKRs, the leading leading indicators for those OKRs um, uh, and so that you can get involved early and the reporting uh, and uh, and clear clear measurement and reporting of those uh, of those leading indicators to your KPIs. So you mean spend time defining those OKRs, thinking well what those OKRs should be. Yeah. So what I do, what's helped me a lot, at least, is not only the OKRs, um, but also what are the leading indicators to the OKRs? Because if you if you're if you're able to define. You know, let's say that your KR is a top line, and and you're and you're and you're in B two B sales. You know, you being able to have leading indicators and from a pipeline point of view of how many enterprise merchants or or customers you're talking to, where you are on the level, and 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 being able to really have clear leading indicators in regards to that help helps to be able to get get in early, right, and and uh, and not clean up messes. It's always better to prevent stuff than it is to. Uh, to uh, take care of the consequences. That, from my personal experience, has been helpful. Okay, and Antoine, can you tell us a little bit more about those two situations you just referred to, where you thought that you could not grow um, fast enough for Gojek? I mean, you know, um, one of them was really about when we when we started charging merchants um, uh, uh, commissions on Go Food. Right? I mean, Gojek had a strategy on the food side where we just scraped content and put everything on Go Food. But then I, I uh, you know, I was in charge of of, uh, of the merchant uh, sales teams at the time, no longer at the time, 
and uh, and uh, you know when uh, it was we had very clear OKRs on uh, on on getting the commissions up to a certain level by SMB merchants and enterprise merchants. You know, it was really bad. I'm not I'm not a sales guy by training. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm just a consultant. You know, I, I know nothing, and so I actually had to uh, I had to go and and uh, and really learn a new skill, which is uh, l l learning the sales frameworks and how you actually do heat maps uh, inside uh, entities and, and, and so on. So I, I had to do it because the teams I had on me didn't know that either. Uh, and that was tough. That was difficult, you know, uh, and, but I grew, I, you know, I, I feel, I don't know if it's the same for, for you guys, but some, I feel that sometimes in your career, you hit a certain level and then, and then you all of a sudden, you know, you hit a plateau and then all of a sudden you can, you know, if you manage to find the way you can grow again and, and get to the next plateau. Mm. 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 Well, that's, that's uh, amazing. Yeah, just, uh, just a few things to add, right. I think, uh, you know, maybe to Anton's point on, leading indicators, uh, one of the things that I learned at Amazon um, five years back was focus on the inputs to the business. So you can't just magically create GMV or orders or rides or whatever it is. You have to realize what are the four or five things, like for example, for GMV, um, you know, it is, uh, which is revenue, right? Proxy for revenue in e-commerce. It is assortment selection, right? It is the pricing is the in-stock ratio um, it is all the traffic that you drive. And so all it's like price times volume, right? And so you have to really optimize for those things. Uh, similarly in, you know, I'm B2B sales, right? It's really understanding the pipeline. Uh, how many deals do we need to, uh, leads do we need to put into the funnel every week? What is the, what is the kind of stages that they are based on the Salesforce kind of definition? What is the conversion rate by, by stage? So there is some science to understand, okay, if I need to do X, this is all the inputs that I need to do in every week, every month, blah, 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 every quarter, because otherwise in Lazar in the early days when I joined, uh, and even in one championship, it is more about before we set up these processes and understood the scientific, uh, you know, way of doing things. Uh, cause that's why CEOs hire you, right? They, they hire you because they think you know what you're doing. Um, the, the question that Max would ask me in Lazada is okay. How many iPhones are we selling tomorrow? That, that is not a sustainable question, nor is it a sustainable answer because people in those days, in the early days would just put iPhone at $200 off in Indonesia. And guess what? People would love that, but that's not sustainable. And so you have to really think about all these other metrics, define the OKR, define the KPIs, define everything in black and white, codify it, uh, make sure everyone understands it. I think communication is a very big thing in a startup because guess what? No one sends long emails. Uh, yeah. No one has time for that. Uh, I speak to, let's say, a CEO 10 times a day, but I need to make sure the troops understand the distillation of those messages. It doesn't mean I need to communicate 10 times a day to the folks, but once or twice a week, I need to make sure that the key things are parsed and filtered and sent over. My job is to and be also, right? yeah. Yeah, and, Sorry, and, and also how to use communication, not just as an alignment tool, but as a tool that, drives bottom-up innovation and inspiration, right? Because that is what is going to allow you to uh, become dispensable because that's bo that bottom-up innovation is, 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 is flowing up, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, before we start asking the questions from the public, and, and please vote for the questions because we are going to try to prioritize them according to the number of votes that you have. I would like to have maybe one question before we go to the, to the questions in, in the Q&A. Um, can you tell me about uh, one learning or one failure that you have had in, in Lazada or, or in... Uh, well, in Lazada, in Guan, or in Gojek, right? Uh, that has taught you quite a lot about uh, business, about how to grow up the startup, about how to grow up yourself, right? So Antoine was referring to a situation before where he, he thought he was not growing fast enough. But what about a failure, right? One of the things that Chatri says is that the only way to greatness is, is failing, right? Uh, and that's something very, very inspirational. Uh, tell me about a time you have failed in, in your company and what you yeah, learned to, about that. 
you know the, see whenever i go to any meeting with chatri i generally also be prepared to uh, you know <laughs> write my resume because you know i'm quite i wear my heart in my sleeve i'm not afraid to uh, nowadays right nowadays but when i started at one championship uh, i was generally you know quite afraid uh, because you know i spent time at lazada and you know max was known to be a tyrannical ceo of lazada you know mm. i used to get shouted at you know every week but I, 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 heard, I heard about that. Chatri had a bit of an aura, right? Like the social media personality of Chatri. Uh, I, I, I almost like think of him as a mentor, think of him as, a, uh, you know, someone I would like a sensei, right? And uh, I would always feel that it was um, my business to fix everything before it bubbled up to him. So Chatri had told me when I joined that, you know, this is a place where you share bad news uh, openly and freely. I'm... he said please share any bad news with me anytime you know i can whatsapp him tell him in in team meetings and there was one certain piece of bad news which i thought i could fix myself because it was a really major piece of bad news and i didn't want to look like a complete asshole in front of him so i tried to fix it um and guess what it was also with a, another ceo of another decacon uh and and then uh, this ceo and him apparently ha- happened to be friends also and uh, before i could fix this piece of bad news uh, the word already reached him through the private relationship they had um and so uh, it came down to me and you know i got completely toasted for that one uh, because it came across that i was hiding the piece of news even though i i wanted to actually fix it before sharing the result with him so i think that was a big wake up call for me it was a used as a kind of case study like a hbs case study uh to the all the leaders about why you shouldn't hide news and blah 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 uh, so i was made a bit of a uh, you know uh, uh my 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 thing was a case study right so but i realized the importance of that right because i think it is really important to raise bad news not to feel bad and not to feel ashamed but uh, in the context of solving a problem together uh, and rather than be intimidated which i was i should have felt that there was a clear channel for me to do it and so in that instance i completely you know went into the shell uh thinking that when he said please share bad news or just lip service but i actually got caught out because the news reached him before i communicated so for me that was a big lesson and now whenever i go to a meeting i wear my heart on my sleeve i completely communicate everything um and you know uh, ready to update the resume if the news is too bad as well <laughs> mm-hmm. and what about you anton i mean personal challenges i think um i mean the one that hari talked about is 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 interesting um i would say that um me it's uh it's uh, i have i have a tendency sometimes of uh, of uh, of of uh, even even if i'm very quantitative of quantitative of being too nice and i think it's very important to be honest with yourself with your people uh and to realize that you know your people can't grow sometimes also or you made mistakes and i think it's important to actually uh uh be willing to uh, let go of people uh i think it's very important because what happens in uh in a in a in a in or that's you know a company that's moving extremely fast is that people become the bottleneck very quickly um and so i've been i've been burned a, a couple times when you know i realized that that uh, people it wasn't because of ethics or anything like that but it just they they just couldn't couldn't uh, uh keep up and uh and you know one of them the the one of them was there for too long and it started becoming a big problem because when it was time for him to go he he felt betrayed and had an amazing conversation with him and and our head of hr about you know basically having to explain to him on you know that he was in the wrong company and he was in the wrong career and I knew that but i think i think it was it, it was it, it was a bit too late you know uh, so i think that's that's important uh, it i know but it's a bit um fluffy but difficult to uh to uh let people go yeah that that's incredibly so learning difficult learning that do that quick quicker is better yeah but it's important and i think it's you, know, you have to do it for the other sometimes if somebody's not cutting it if you've already given the feedback if you're already tried to make them better and they're not doing it the best thing is to have a conversation that says hey you're not in the right place this is not this is not the right place for you that, there are other places where you'll be happier difficult. where you'll be able to go there 
yeah it is um, you know the, the one thing i'll add you know it, it was very very difficult for me so when you do all these personality tests right uh, intj and all that whatever it is i always skew as someone who has a lot of empathy and emotion um that's my bad uh, because in a startup culture you can't always exhibit that so in lazara i remember that was one of my biggest thing max were always telling me you need to fire this person you need to fire this person you need to fire this person i would always wait and you know i would end up doing their work myself blah 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 to create this buffer and i think in lazara i fired probably three people uh, out of the 250 people org in my three and a half years three people that is one that is tough because it was uh, i had to do a complete turnaround and i've fired probably 10 times that number of people uh, in the last 2 years in 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 one yeah uh, but the the difficult thing is not when you have to let somebody go that is not performing or that has done something uh, wrong and ethical is when a person is performing but is starting to become a bottleneck for that job that is growing every day at a certain rate uh, but the person so the the job is growing every day at at x and and the person is growing at half of that speed um uh, it's not that the person is bad it's just that you foresee that is already is starting to become a problem right and that is what is particularly difficult because the person could be good maybe maybe at a lower level right maybe maybe in some yeah, situations yeah, what you have to do yeah, is to yeah, hire yeah. a boss yeah so i'm always a big proponent of people moving through so whether after you've completed 12 18 months whatever it is go find another job or i'll help you with this other department if they are a fit again we can't force feed people uh, we can recommend and be an advocate if the person is generally good focuses on the values is a generally good performer if they've outgrown the job and everyone outgrows the job i outgrew my job at lazara uh i'm sure someday i'll outgrow my job at one um, we all outgrow jobs and so uh, i think a good manager will really make sure that the person gets other skill sets that are more in line or something that they want to learn so how do you think the 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 relations in a startup should be should it be more like a family like a caring family or should it be more like a competitive uh sports team you are in, you are in a sports company right should it be more of a relatively more ruthless competitive sports team or or a caring family or it depends on the situation i think it depends on the situation so when i was at amazon um and again uh, part of my time at amazon i really didn't enjoy and part of that was everyone was biting everyone right you know like piranhas in a sea of sharks that's how amazon was they were hire really type a people and then they would put them together and make everyone like go for each other and so i really didn't like that again given my personality i think the way i tailor feedback today is um, really encourage and praise people in public so people understand what are the behaviors that i like and recognize and i coach people in private i don't again uh, mm. salt or uh, you know coach or, or or you know give private feedback constructive feedback publicly um but the key is for me my first job at microsoft almost 20 years ago uh the guy the vp at the of the division said a good manager makes the team look great uh and then i watched this thing and i encourage all of you to watch this if you have time it's called the playbook on netflix it's a playbook it's a coach's rules for life and there are several coaches there from uh, doc rivers to uh serena williams coach there are many great rules out there which talk about how teams can perform high performance culture uh things like ubuntu and other things right which <laughs> some until someone tells you you may not internalize it but uh i think for for us uh, having this dog eat dog hyper competitive at least for me is not very healthy i would rather encourage in a equal way behaviors that are respected and tolerated and are rewarded okay and i would tell people privately what are the things which are not cool very good excellent let's let's start with the questions from the public right um here we have a very very practical question uh that is what is your advice on the top three things uh that that one must do and the top three things that one must not do in fund raising during a pandemic uh during the pandemic what are the three things you would do and the three things that you should not do when you are raising funds in a pandemic Who would like to take this? Oh, Antoine, 
seems to have disconnected. Maybe it has some con connectivity yeah. problems. Um, uh, so, yeah, or maybe he's back, yeah. Or maybe he didn't hear the question. Should we repeat the question? He's back here. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Antoine, how are you? Um, yeah, sorry. Internet issues. I think I got booted off the... Yeah, no worries, no worries. Uh, wonderful. So we have a question here from the public. What is your advice on the top three things somebody, one, must do uh, and the top three things one must not do when you are fundraising during a pandemic? I don't know that the pandemic really changes that much in terms of fundraising. I think a lot of the, I mean, you know, if we're talking about technology, I think technology is uh, luckily a pretty okay during the pandemic. I, you know, I would say fundraising, um, number one, is having a very good presentation and deck is very important where you're focusing on the why, why, why you know, why are you doing the story, uh, what you're doing, uh, how and, and the what, you know, the traditional uh, pain points. Uh, a pretty clear business plan, uh, 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 and uh, and the team has to be, you know, uh, the team. A lot of VCs focus a tremendous amount on on the team, the founders, and and the and the N minus one, the direct reports. Yeah. Um, to add to that, I think uh, so. You know, we were. I agree. I don't think pandemic uh, really alters. If you believe in your business model and you have a sound business model, pandemic should not alter. Uh, how you pitch or how you uh, create uh, the value proposition to investors, either new or existing. Um, and for us, we went through this uh, this year. So a bit of uh, reflection. I think you really have to be authentic, you know, especially if you're going for multiple, you know, you're in your series E or D, um, you know, for us, so series E, um, you know, a lot of the existing investors uh, participated again, uh, like Tamasek. Um, we had some new investors as well. Uh, I almost look at it like, you know, uh, like a dating game, you know, when you're going out in high school, prom, whatever, uh, you know, you're going out for the first time, everyone is like, you know, on their best behavior. Uh, you're looking the best, you're dressed well. Uh, by the time Series E happens, everyone knows the good, bad and ugly, right? It's like you're almost getting married. <laughs> you know, you know what you're in for. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so I really think you have to be authentic. I think you have to continue to be extremely passionate of the vision and the long term. Uh, because if the founding team and the management team is not passionate or doesn't believe, it's very difficult for someone existing or new to believe. Uh -huh. uh, and I think uh, three is to show, um, to Anton's point, I think they really need to meet the different people in the management team. So both in Lazada, uh, when uh, I joined back in 2015, Alibaba interviewed me for several hours. Uh, so with every other leader, uh, and even now, uh, you know, all the investors interviewed the key uh, folks in the management team. I think it's really important to know that this is not a founder only driven business. Tomorrow, what happens to the founder? Something happens, right? Founder leaves, founder exits. Like in terms of Gojek, Nadeem took a government role, right? It's amazing, yeah. but yeah. the company still can still thrive and, 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 you know, the people are still there. And so it's really important to see the diversity. Um, and so that's what I would, I would completely recommend, uh, um, things um, is, uh, you know, make stuff up or be, uh, again, no integrity or, you know, bluff your way through. That's again, I think, the, that'll easily be called out as possible. And how do you see, this is another question here related to investors. How do you see the difference in the investor base before and after becoming a $1 billion company. Uh, uh, is the investor profile different at that point? That should be around series D or F, something like that. Um, how does the investor base change at that point? I think to what I said earlier, I think the investor base after a billion dollars, see, to me also the first, uh, again, it's a very uh, rare thing that a startup becomes a unicorn. Um, I think it's like one in uh, 10 million startups becomes a unicorn. Uh, so that's already very rare, but I think it is still okay. If you have a great business plan, you have a great vision, you have interviewed the founders and management team to believe in the, in the thing and you can get to a billion dollars. I think the thing that separates a billion to multi-billion is especially now, right? Again, after we work and other things, 
um, is really, is the business sustainable? Are you creating a flywheel? Are you creating a platform? Uh, do you need a very capital intensive uh, in business or, or, or you know, PNL or infrastructure to survive? Um, and really understand the fundamental drivers of the business. Uh, I think if that is very clear and that is built like a flywheel, you know, flywheel is, uh, you know, should turn on its own, right? And it usually has two or three inputs and it keeps turning on its own. Then that is something which investors would probably invest. But, between but the question is more like, are in investors after 1 billion, the same kind of people as before 1 billion or uh, the, the kind of investors you attract at that point start to be different kind of people. As you are getting closer to becoming a future public company, does that investor profile change? I, yeah, I mean, it, it changes. It changes, right? You need, yeah. It depends on who you have. I and mean, if you have VCs only, small VCs at the beginning, then you do need to tap into the bigger VCs like Sequoia or people or the sovereign wealth ones like the Temasek, right? I mean, the Gojek first round was was a Silicon Island, so VC, you know, second round was with uh, Sequoia, still very VC-based, Rak Rakuten uh, and, and others. And then and then you start tapping into private equity companies, sovereign wealth fund, uh, and other, because you're raising more money. Uh, and, you know, people who can write $50, $50 million checks, is, there aren't that many people who can write $50 million checks. So, so it's, yep. yeah, it changes. But it, it's quite, I mean, you'll see it coming if you get to that point. You'll know who all the investors are already. And, and I think you're right. I think, um, you know, the, uh, I saw that at Lazada. So Lazada was initially invested by Tomasek, um, you know, and then also Kinevik and JP Morgan uh, banking kind of private equity uh, companies. And then it was an e-commerce company, ultimately our platform business that bought Lazada, Alibaba, right? So between the one and 5 billion range is where someone who understood what the hell you were doing versus just looking for an exit multiple came after you. Same thing with us. We're a billion dollars today at one. Uh, we do have the traditional guys like the Masex, Sequoia, who are after platform internet companies. I wouldn't be surprised in future rounds if a uh, Disney or, um, you know, a Tencent, mm -hmm. Netflix, one of those guys come because we're a media business and they really need to understand media. So I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, very good. Uh, another question. Uh, given the scarcity of time in a startup, how do you juggle between driving performance versus making time available to coach less experienced employees? It's a great question. I think it's a very hard balance um, to do. Um, uh, we are very operational in a startup. Uh, there's a daily fire under the ass, um, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, and I think I think every leader has to make their own decision based on how much time is needed to solve the fire drills of the day or the week or the month uh, and how to please external stakeholders and, and your bosses and, and how to coach and develop your team. Uh, I think both of them are needed, but I think every leader will make their own decision uh, on the time allocation. Yeah, but it's a hard, it's a hard trade off. What you get in January may be different than in February maybe different in August. It's not consistent. Like I did never have one-on-ones with my, my people from Lazada days. I, I would just not have it in the calendar because I couldn't afford it. So, uh, but what I would do is in the, wherever I was, whichever country I was in, I would walk in the office in the morning with a cup of coffee, check in with everyone, one-on-one, -on -one, like five, 10 minutes. And people can call me anytime, WhatsApp, Skype, whatever. Mm -hmm. You choose the way in which you want to be accessible versus building it as a regimented, structured thing that I had at Microsoft and Amazon and other places. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. There is another, yes, Antoine? No, no, yeah. I, I mean, I agree. I, I okay. agree with what Harry says. I think, I think being, I think having OKRs helps because then you have meetings to review those, those KPIs and, and then one-on-ones are important because it's about emotional health also. It's not just about, it's not just about how, problem solving on their issues it's also about how they're doing and that's motivation and morale so difficult excellent there is another question here from mario 
uh, about uh, bigger companies. Do bigger companies, especially tech platforms, have comp competitive scaling advantage in times of COVID? Many mid or smaller companies will struggle to survive. What strategies are you using to capitalize? And what strategies should smaller startups take to ensure they survive or are not permanently hobbled? wants to take this one i mean it's a it's a very good question i, I i've seen i i think that you know i think that brand uh comes into play at some point uh i'll give you an illustration of that you know when 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 uh when covid hit before covid in go food about 20 percent uh, 18 to 20 percent of all of our GMV was coming from large enterprise chains such as McDonald's, KFC, you know, uh, people like that. After after COVID hit, uh, the proportion went up to 30 percent, uh, and and so I think it's I think it's natural that in times of duress, people revert back to the things that they can trust, and that comes back to brand and branding. So there's there that's one factor. The other thing is that. People are people are fighting on, uh, on 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 so many different fronts during COVID that they basically want something that works, and so they're going to be willing to pay for things that work, so they don't have to think about about that that uh, uh, anymore. Um, in terms of what to think about, I think as a startup, I think variable pricing. Uh, this is my commercial hat, but I think you know being aligned in how you price uh, with what the objectives are of your client uh, or customers is very important. So variable variable pricing is uh is, a, is, a, is one way to do it um uh and uh and then uh finding anchor uh anchor customers or clients that can help you through this time i think is very important and serving serving them in the best way that you can but that would, that's what i would i would recommend i think it's um also uh, to add on to anton um it's you know you have to some way be lucky you have to be in the right place at the right time who the hell had heard of zoom before january yeah i had not yeah. and look at where they are today who had hell hell had heard of uh, like a twilio or any of these other companies right so um in many ways it's being at the right place at the right time uh, i think ultimately you also have to look at your own business model uh look at your cash flow look at the cash in the bank and there are several fundamentals of startups that you have to have sacrosanct uh, and make those changes as needed because everyone right now is looking for multi-year runways and you have to see what is your burn uh, on a monthly basis and uh, when, when do you think you will have a chance to raise again if you if you do um, and where can you monetize and, and and bring in revenues and so that modeling has to be done and it's a it's a due diligence that you have to do but being in the right place at the right time, yeah, then more power to you. I think there are many companies that have thrived uh, in these times. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, I think, Hari, you know, one of the things when people uh, uh, ask Nadim, you know, what's the secret of the success? And he would always answer first timing. And I, I always get a pet peeve about, about founders and, and tech leaders that always start talking about themselves about you know how their success is because of, of, uh, of you know, the amount of work and how amazing they are. I mean, don't never underestimate luck in general uh, and uh, and all that. It, it can make you feel good or it can make you feel uh, better but um, yeah luck is a critical component of huge. any startup founder success anyone who says that luck is not a big factor is lying yeah yeah just move on go to the next person <laughs> well yeah very interesting. Well, we are uh, reaching the end of our time, and I wanted to end with one one question about uh, the role of, of listed companies or how listed companies are uh, comparable to unicorns, right? When we were preparing this conversation, Antoine, you say something about uh, the fact that uh, yesterday's unicorns were uh, yesterday unicorns were stars. Uh, but now they are like uh, publicly listed companies, right? And actually, uh, blue chips are, are not doing very bad. Uh, if you look at the performance of Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, uh, they are still doing extremely well. 
Um, and one of the things we were saying as well was that probably or maybe the next 10 years are going to be a blue chip decade. And I found your thoughts really, really, really interesting. And I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you if you could develop these thoughts a little bit more. Why do you think the next 10 years are going to be a blue chip decade? I, I think that, uh, and I'd love to hear Hari's uh, opinion on this, but I think that, you know, a, a lot of the technology uh, components were very murky for the last 10 to 10 to 15 years. But a lot of these components are now being very accessible and very well understood by blue chip companies. And I think that the, that, you know, more brick and mortar companies have a lot of, of uh, advantages uh, and have a lot of things going for them. A lot of, uh, 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 you know, amazing competitive advantage. They've got content, uh, they already have very well-established uh, uh, distribution networks, uh, so access to uh, access to customers. They've got um, a, a throes of data, a huge amount of data. They might not yet uh, fully understand how to uh, how to use it, um, but they've got a lot of data, uh, and uh, and and they've got a, a very well set HR processes, recruiting practices, compensation practices, and uh, and all that. Uh, and if they're profitable, they have cash. So I, I personally think that um, a lot of innovation and threats uh, is is going to come from uh, from blue chip blue chip companies. Uh, an example that I use um, is is uh, is Walmart. I think Walmart has done amazing decisions and has made a lot of the right choices in uh, in uh, in uh, in the last few years. One another thing that I think we'll see is that the world is really becoming O two O. I know it's a little bit of a, of a catchphrase, but, you know, we were talking about Hari's doing e-gaming, but he's also doing live events. You know, that's a form of O2O. I, I think it's, a, it's ex, I think that the, the view of the customer has to be thought of from all of the customer's personas, whether it's their offline need to shop, whether it's their online need to shop uh, and how, you know, and engaging with them everywhere. So it's going to be an interesting decade, really interesting decade. I mean, look at Visa, PayPal, well, PayPal is a bad example. Visa, Mastercard, uh, in the last uh, ten years. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's amazing. Yeah, I think uh, you know the uh, I, I'd say the answer really depends. Also, um, like you know, the Microsoft of today is very different than the Microsoft I was in two thousand three. Yeah. I was part of. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, like Microsoft Teams is taking on Zoom. It may not be as uh, sexy, or but it's still it's still uh, you know one of the the most profitable divisions. They're really um, going cycles. Walmart is They're a really great going example. Cycles. Exactly. So, so, so the thing is, right? This, right? You can't control the waves that are coming at you, but what you can do is learn how to surf. So, it's really about how you respond to the threats of what exists out there. You can, and great leadership is what really defines that in a blue chip company, right? So, Nadella, I think, who's also a booth alum, I think I credit that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. The fact that uh, he is responding very well to to not just COVID but also what is out there. Um, I think also that uh, you know Walmart and other things, right? They've either through acquisitions or through hiring great people, um, and PayPal and uh, you know Visa, Mastercard, they're all innovating and they're being agile. I think the key is blue chip companies have cash in the bank. They have a great balance sheet. That's their advantage compared to a startup. But I think it's how you use it. And can you be agile? You can't afford to be stuck in the 90s or early 2000s and do business. If you have that mindset of being agile, uh, again, I use the Microsoft example of today, my very different, more agile business. Uh, Windows and Office no longer make uh, a dent in the business anymore. No one talks about Windows. When I was in Microsoft 2003, Obama used to say Windows and Office, Windows 80% of the business. Today, it's Azure. It's all their Office 365, again, cloud-based, and it's yeah. the new stuff. Uh, so it's how you respond. It's how you learn to how you reinvent yourself. And go for the waves that come after you. Yeah. And those waves that come to you depend on luck. So we are going back to the to the previous topic about, uh, <laughs> I mean, sometimes you those waves you cannot control. Control. <laughs> yeah? You have to Are be aware. <laughs> you still well, have to look. Excellent. Uh, I think it has been an extremely uh, interesting conversation. I think we have learned 
quite a lot of things. At least I have learned a lot of, of things with you. Uh, so thank you so much for being here with me and with the 80 plus people that were connected live and probably more people that are gonna watch this webinar when it is published on YouTube, because this is gonna be on YouTube, on the YouTube page of the, of the uh, University of Chicago School of Business. Uh, we have discussed about a lot of things today. We have discussed about how the last nine months uh, with COVID has been in, in one championship or in Gojek, about the difference between a sustainable business and a unicorn, about the important role of processes, setting up SOPs and setting KPIs in order to, to be able to, to become more operationally efficient. And sometimes this is demanded by investors as well. Um, about how unicorns compare to listed companies, values, failures, uh, so I think it has been an amazing conversation. I thank you so much for your time, uh, for spending this one hour and a half with us. And uh, also thank you very much for, to, to everybody who is watching. Um, and uh, well, it has been great. I have learned a lot. And uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you very much, Harry. I will uh, catch up with you when I go to, to Singapore. Hopefully soon we can we can travel again and the same thing for you Hopefully uh, we can Antoine in Jakarta. For holidays and meet Antoine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, pleasure. probably probably yeah. we can go to Bali to meet Antoine. Uh, yes. On... <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, see you soon. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.